so game studies exist right now in a really interesting sort of space that, that we're right now just learning what it is that's important to ask, um, figuring out who we should really be talking to and understanding, you know, how can we uh, approach you know, certain problems, um, cer certain affordances that the, the world gives you, uh, and, and ways of sort of thinking about and talking about and doing things with that stuff. And I, I think that's, you know, a, a really great place to be in that we're creating a field, you know, kind of in many ways, brand new. People in game studies enjoy um, the sort of punk rock um, aspect of being a games um, scholar. Uh, and so it's a pretty new world. Yeah. And so the theory we're creating as we go along. Yeah. There's opportunities for for interplay between many, many groups. Um, and at, at the research level, it's happening. We are having institutes that we are forming, centers that we are forming, that we're trying to get all these diverse people in and talking to each other. I'm pretty sure we'll come to a day where it all pretty, you know, you'll probably, just as you had your English class, you know, in every level of schooling, you'll have your game design class, right? And you'll just get it deeper and deeper. And then you'll probably take it into designing institutions or designing. See, look, games are designing a particular interaction with technology and people. That skill, how do you design, in, uh, you know, social technical engineering, how do you design social interaction with technology and tools to get collaborative and collective intelligence is going to be a central thing, not just in games, but across the board. Um, fortunately, game studies, you know, in terms of sort of the academy in general, uh, you know, is gaining so much momentum, even in the last just couple of years, um, that it, it, it's becoming more acceptable to say, I work in video games. Um, you know, there are conferences dedicated to it. There are, Lots of journals dedicated to it. There are people um, at you know, universities throughout the country and throughout the world who do game studies, so it's becoming more legitimate in the eyes of the academy. Um, I started life as a linguist, uh, working on abstract properties of language that didn't have much relevance to social issues. I only got involved with video games uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago, when my six-year-old son played Pajama Sam and I played with him and I wondered what an adult game was like because I found Pajama Sam very intriguing um, and uh, bought my first adult game and was just blown away by how hard it was, how frustrating and that people paid for this it was uh, amazing. But I, I, as I stuck with it, I got really into it and realized that there was something really compelling about it once you got over the hump of putting up with the failure, because it is a form of learning, right? and uh, then got addicted enough to games that I knew if I didn't write about them, I wouldn't have a career anymore, so began to write about them. background in game studies comes from when I was a PhD student at Wisconsin-Madison, and um, I was um, looking for courses outside of my immediate field of rhetoric and composition studies in the English department and a lot of folks have recommended Jim G's course in literacy and other course he teaches on discourse analysis. Uh, but it turned out that at the time he was getting ready to start uh, teaching courses on games. Um, he was working on the rough draft of his first book, um, What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. Um, and ended up a part of his research team there and doing a lot of interdisciplinary work in games research um, with him in education while I continued working on my PhD in rhetoric and composition studies. Um, and from there I went to do a postdoc at MIT in comparative media studies um, and continued teaching classes um, on games research and game, I called it video game theory and analysis. It was sort of a humanities take on games. I'm Lena Johnson Glenberg, and I am in psychology and at the Learning Sciences Institute. And uh, <clears throat> you know, my background to games is that I actually did not believe in them. So I got uh, some SBIR funding, actually four of these small grants, to mm -hmm. make this uh, really cool learning application to teach metacognitive strategies to middle school kids for reading. And I really purposely designed it to be very linear, and that it was like attractive with you know icons and, and an avatar type of agent, it, um, you know, I really didn't want it to be too gamey. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, needless to say, it was not a runaway hit. <laughs> and then I just had to sort of rethink what that meant and why I was anti-games and if there was a better way to do it. And I've really um, been interested in this world since then. 
Yeah, my name is Ashish Amrish. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Technology and Innovation at Arizona State University. My expertise is game design and development, more from the software side, the architecture of games. And uh, I've been uh, in the industry before. Uh, I worked for LucasArts in the late 90s um, and made the transition to academics to try and build game development programs and curriculum and so it's been my real strength and expertise. Uh, I used to always play games, you know, from N64 and even before with Atari. Um, I always had consoles, you know, I, w I would always break them so I never had consoles for the longest time. Uh, my name is Jeff Holmes, I'm a PhD student here at ASU in English and Rhetoric and Composition. I've been a gamer for God, more than 30 years now. Uh, my uh, uh, family had, you know, computers. I, I grew up with the Atari you know, 2600 and ColecoVision and television. You know, so I, it, the TRS-80. You know, I have a lot of street cred in, in old computing and stuff like that. So I've been playing games for a long, long time, um, and it was always a really fond uh, time when I when I reflect back on what I was doing and stuff. You know, I think about my family. Uh, my brother is really important. He and I have always gamed together. Um, usually I watched him game because he's older. Uh, so you know, it, it has a lot of sort of emotional resonance to me, first of all, just, just to play video games. When I became interested academically in video games, I was uh, an undergraduate working here at ASU, working on my um, BA in literature. And I took a course in rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric of video games. Um, and it was my first real rhetoric course. Um, so it, it introduced me to a lot of the sort of terminology and the way of thinking about things that I, I liked through rhetoric, uh, and also captured that sort of interest in, in video games as well. So uh, it got to not only sort of broaden, you know, some academic or intellectual horizons, but it also got to capture something that I'm really passionate about uh, on a sort of personal level. So um, when I realized that you could do a college course and get credit for video games and learn something really awesome, when I said, "This is there's something here." It needs to be more comprehensive than just analysis. It needs to look at the whole breadth of what's what's possible, why something succeeded, why something failed. You know, why Nintendo was great, why it's not working so much as a console anymore, and what could what could be the next big thing. So in. So now you're asking some solid research questions. It's not just studying what exists. And then and then it can evolve into something from a top-down you know, program. And you can call that game studies. Um, one of the things that makes games research a, uh, a boundary-breaking field is that uh, it's so interdisciplinary and the, I think the mistake that people made early on in games research was exactly that, was trying to define it by its method, the way that English departments rose up, um, trying to define themselves by their method and their criticism. Um, there's not a singular method for studying games and that's what makes them so wonderful. Library, but also I just think, especially if you're coming in like as a newbie or something, like to get the theory, you need a couple of months of theory and thinking it through and looking at other things and then you start coding and creating and then by the end of that year, but you could have some things track. Yeah. <clears throat> It'd be an awesome course. The, the opportunity right now, I think, is serious games. Yeah. You know, um, games as a medium of expression. Okay, so in, in the late, well, even in the mid 90s, how many people knew how to write HTML code, right? Like design a web page. They used to be paid 100,000 bucks to design a web page, right? Today, a middle school student can design a web page, write a blog, express themselves. I see games being that. I've seen games be accessible, easy to develop, reachable. And, and be available to um, anyone who wants to see it, like a blog. And, and we're getting there. We're slowly getting there. The barriers are getting away. But what I wanted to see was um, 
not only game design programs go to college, which they have done with a vengeance, but more importantly, games studied as a liberal art. The way that we took literature and thought this is vicarious experience and it's an expression of discoveries about the world, so are games. And I wanted to see games as liberal art, and I also wanted to see a field of games and learning. That is, games, how do we use them to think about enhancing learning? Since so much of the generation who come to college are gamers, it's time to make that interest, which is, by the way, a great one because it involves art, it involves programming, it involves uh, human interaction, it involves interest-driven groups on the internet that socialize around games and also mod them. So you couldn't imagine really kind of a better thing to put at the center of a liberal arts agenda, but uh, that's happening more slowly than I hoped. I think a directed sort of disciplinary um, mindset for game studies would be good and bad. Um, good in the sense that it can connect a lot of people in a lot of really disparate sort of ways of thinking about and talking about doing games, game studies. But you also run the risk of you know, someone you know, taking over game studies in the sense that their perspective or the, you know, the, the institutional perspective is the one that becomes the right answer. Um, at ASU, one of the things that's really lacking is just the ability to find each other. Um, there's a bunch of people you know, here on campus and, and affiliated with the university who are interested in games, think about games, make games, do things around games, but it's really hard to find each other. Um, often we find ourselves sort of in silos, um, whether those are disciplinary silos, so we're AME, or we're computer science, or we're you know, law, or we're, you know, we're the humanities, or whatever it is, um, and they don't talk through those silos. Um, or there's just a, you know, it's such a massive space full of lots of people and lots of you know, other noise that sometimes it can be hard to cut through the, the chatter of what's going on to find each other in the first place. So I think one thing that's really lacking is some sort of mechanism to just find other people who are interested in the same thing, connect them together, give them a space to kind of work with each other and, and, and make things happen. I think if we had a meeting, like maybe a giant round table, we all sat around and introduced ourselves, and so it wasn't even so much of a, a speaker coming in, but everyone is interested in games, sitting around talking about what they're doing, what they're working on, where they want to be going, where they want to be heading towards. True, and then to share that knowledge is important, right? So they've learned it, they've done it well, or they've done it poorly, and also share your failures, that's important. Mm -hmm. And so to get that word out and share it, that there needs to be more of that, mm -hmm. and that's why I like So how do we connect people around a problem rather than through a department? Um, and that can be one solution for game study. Thinking through, you know, this isn't a computer problem, or this isn't a problem of, you know, philosophical problem of seeing the world, but these are ways that we can talk about what game studies are. So fighting through sort of institutional barriers is, a, is one thing that absolutely the, the, the optimistic one is that it morphs into a really large area of investigation and uh, entrepreneurial projects around discovery where we're making games, not just for entertainment, but for health, for learning, uh, and for collective intelligence, for amateur science, for uh, all sorts of stuff. The benefits would be that, uh, I just feel like that the colleagues know what we're doing, that the students get to meet each other and get to share stories, and what. so it's emotional networking and connection for the students, and then for the faculty members, we just know what each other's doing, and then can build a cohesion that might maybe become a center for game creation. Like, besides the monthly meeting where we all get together, is to have some showcases. Like maybe at those meetings, once everyone can present what their lab's doing, or to have like, you know, in the spring we have a big showcase of some of the learning games that are being created. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fine line. I think overall, yes, there would be a benefit to directing game studies a little more, if for no other reason than we can connect people and connect ideas. We have to be careful about directing it too rigidly in one way uh, at the expense of other uh, sort of ways of thinking about and doing gaming. And so a, a bottom-up organization is an interesting way of thinking about it in that you know students or faculty or people outside of the university can come and share their knowledge and their experience and, and the things that they're doing with games um, and make those sort of connections with each other. And, and then the people who are doing the work can then figure out what's important to them. Um, again, the risk then is that it's going to be a lot of noise and not a lot of sort of direction towards what uh, you know what is important. What I had always hoped is that as game studies developed, it would not become another kind of uh, 
angels on the head of a pin academic area, you know, a bunch of postmodern, ludic, theorizing, detached from any reality of games, right? Pessimistic is that people will continue to write about games in the same way that they did 10 years ago, um, that nobody will do anything new, um, that will continue to sort of repeat the same studies. Um, and those studies will get published because it might be new in that particular field, but it's not new to the game studies community. The threat, I think the big threat, really is, is our administrative departments, the structures that we have at university that majority of the times don't facilitate interaction. Pessimistically, I think that uh, game studies will become sort of a, just, you know, another iteration of sort of territorial battles of, you know, we own game studies, uh, we have the right answers, and then you'll just sort of self-select out of those programs. So if you're interested in programming, you'll only go to the science side and miss out on the fact that there's lots of other important, interesting, exciting questions um, to be asked and to be, to be worked on. Or the potential for games to influence, influence us culturally, um, I think, is much wider than that of traditional media, like novels and like film. Um, because they're interactive media, um, they do have this, um, you know, infinite, emergent thread. Uh, or not even a singular thread, but it's more of an ecosystem around games. And um, because of that, um, there's really no um, linear path that I think that we can take in terms of methods. Um, it's a very tricky space because to get credibility within a games scholarship community, you have to make your work very interdisciplinary. Um, but in order to get credibility within your own field that you're tenuring in, you have to make it relevant to, to your own field. So you're constantly um, um, you know, switching hats, um, and, and I think that it takes a pretty skilled researcher to be able to make it convincing to both audiences. You know, I'm, I don't think there is a, a cohesive games community at ASU. The thing has been too fragmented and it hasn't had a unifying force and it hasn't in particular had a brand that is a niche something that we feel strongly about so so we do more than just curriculum now so we do a little bit of research we do a little bit of development do a little bit of pilot testing and a little bit of publishing Excellent. the universities should uh, begin to start uh, uh, centers that are not academic departments, that bring people together across the, all the boundaries that design requires, which goes from science and technology and programming right through art and scripting and multimedia, um, and, uh, and, and see themselves as doing not just research, but implementation, design, creating double bottom line sustainable businesses that do social good, and having their students able to work on all aspects of that, not just, you know, and, and becoming the university becoming a design center to design new social futures, of which games would be one, not the only thing. I'd like to design a lot of other things, but games are one very good area to think about it, and design is a very important 21st century skill. I really, um, I think there's great potential for growth, and uh, I want to see more uh, student-created content embedded in the games. You know, one thing I would do is get free publishing for students. Where they get the resources at ASU, but ASU says, if you're a student, even though you've used our resources, your our labs, our software, you own all the rights and you can publish it and you can claim everything. That's one thing I would say, right off the bat. Publish games monetarily, mm -hmm. right? We give the students a complete framework from start to finish and they can take their ideas and throw it out into the community. Build all that infrastructure, have it be ready and let them keep com take complete ownership of it. Another thing that ASU really can do that, that can support um, game studies as a, as a program and stuff is, is to you know, continue to provide and, and increase the capacity for the technology itself. Um, you know, games, unfortunately, the one thing about game, you know, video games is that they require a lot of technology. They require um, you know, equipment, they require software, they require space to use it. And stuff like that. So, 
Um, a lot of people are often just stuck with their own laptop or their own console and their own house and stuff like that. And there's not a real centralized place for them to go to the, the way that you could go to the theater to watch a play or you go to the music hall to, to work on music or you go to the library to read books. Um, we don't have a very centralized technological hub for connecting people to the network and stuff like that. Now, there's the internet, and so we can find each other that way. It doesn't necessarily have to go through ASU. But if we want to make some sort of um, ASU-centered game studies program, then ASU also has to recognize that they can provide some infrastructure for people to then bring their technology together. The technology was so clunky back then in 2001. It was hard to make a good-looking game, but now it's so beautiful. The graphics are so beautiful. And it just feels so immersive. And yeah. I think there's so much potential. What is it? Games is different. It's such a rapidly evolving field, a, a, a more top-down, where do you look? What you look's already gone, you know? So that's the biggest challenge with having a game studies program. But if, you, if you're open to that dynamic, rapid change, you know, that, that you're open, that what you're looking at today might not be the same tomorrow, and adapt and grow with it, then it can succeed. That we are surrounded by faculty and students who um, aren't convinced but are willing to be convinced and that's really terrific that's exactly what you want and that's the sign of a true intellectual community. Um, game studies have you know, really crossed a lot of those disciplinary boundaries where we are connecting people together and sharing you know, this common interest that we have in and identifying problems that we can work on together. Um, the thing has already changed radically so you'd be foolish to think it's not going to change even more radically few years. Games cannot survive in a static environment. It needs to be extremely dynamic. Everybody needs to talk to each other. Everybody needs to come together. Um, and I, I, I see good things at ASU happening down the line. Game studies will um, continue to be a strongly interdisciplinary space because each of us who studies games still needs to tenure in our own fields. On the other hand, five years from now, those of us studying games will have tenure, so... <laughs> Video game studies has some really great potential for, for rethinking ways that we do learning, ways that we ask questions, ways that we solve problems. Um, it's also very scary because then you don't have the safety of, well, we've done it this way for hundreds of years. We're in a new space for good and for ill. So you know, we, we get a chance to kind of ma you know, mark our map uh, the way we want to, but that also means that we have to then decide well, what goes on the map. It's an exciting area to be in because it's changing so fast, but it's, it's running up against the problem that in academic institutions are dominated by baby boomers like me, right? We have our tenure, we're pet, we are old and uh, elite. It, but this future doesn't belong to us. The people pushing these innovations at the level of getting them done are people that are young, new professors, even people without BAs. And therefore we really need a way to uh, get the baby boomers to retire. Excellent. Okay. Thank Great. you very much. That was, right. that was wonderful. Good. Okay. Well, good luck with your project.